For many Americans, the sight of this, a square image encased in a white frame, is immediately recognizable. Even in an era where individual images seem insignificant, where cell phones have made photography more accessible to the wider public, a small image ejecting from a camera and developing in front of our eyes still seems so magical. But whereas many people are familiar with the physical images and cameras Polaroid produced throughout their decades in operation, fewer people understand the backstory behind the company and its founder, Edwin Land. Polaroid's legacy is an inspiring story of technological triumph against all odds, but is also a warning tale about how even the most successful companies and inventors can fall from grace in the matter of a few moments. The story of Polaroid is a tale of a product that revolutionized not only how the public saw consumer photography, but also how a simple idea can evolve into a permanent staple of popular culture and the incredible achievements that went into realizing it. Edwin Land, like many famous inventors of the 20th century, started off from relatively simple beginnings. Born May 7, 1909, Land spent much of his childhood tinkering with any mechanical object he could find, much to the chagrin of his father. After first graduating from Norwich Free Academy in 1927, Land would begin to study chemistry at Harvard. However, he left after finishing his freshman year, although he would return a little over a year later until eventually dropping out for good in 1932 to pursue his own ventures. After his first time dropping out, Land focused his attention on a type of filter known as a polarizer. Polarizers are specialized filters that allow for only specific light beams to pass through them, reducing glare and evening out lighting. At the time, the only way to create a polarizing filter was through the use of hierophatite crystals, which were expensive and limited in their use, or through spe specifically assembled calcite crystals, which had to be mined from nature. Land focused on addressing the limitations of the period, and in 1928, the 19-year-old Land created the first synthetic polarizer, which utilized a thin layer of wet microscopic crystals aligned using a magnet. At the time, Land's intentions were to utilize these new polarizing filters in the automotive industry as a way to prevent glare from oncoming headlights. He petitioned the American automotive industry to standardize this feature, and although they declined his request, Land had made himself known as a passionate and forward-thinking inventor. It was through this development that Land linked up with his physics professor from Harvard, George Wheelwright, and founded the Land Wheelwright Laboratories, with the two getting to work on producing polarizers for a, a variety of applications ranging from filters for Kodak to polarized sunglasses. Wheelwright would remain a member of the company until 1937, with his last major success with Land being the creation of an early version of 3D glasses for Chrysler's World Fair exhibit. With Land now solely at the head of the company, the now renamed Polaroid Corporation continued steady for the next few years. The company's first major period of growth was the result of the entry of the United States into the Second World War, as Polaroid became one of the many military contractors of the U.S. Armed Forces during the war. Throughout the war, Polaroid developed specialized equipment for use by the armed forces, including, but not limited to, specialized goggles for the army that could be variably darkened and lightened, optics for reconnaissance, bomb sites, and early heat-seeking technology, a unique 3D imaging system for reconnaissance aircraft known as the Vectograph, which allowed for detailed terrain mapping for bombing missions. Polaroid was also responsible for a significant medical advance of the period with the creation of the first synthetic form of quinine to combat shortages of the vital substance, which, were, which was mass produced to prevent malaria in the Pacific theater. It was during the war that the first hints at Polaroid's future began to emerge. While on vacation with his family during 1943, Land photographed his daughter using his film camera. After taking the photo, his daughter remarked, why can't I see the picture now? A question which sparked Land's curiosity. Upon returning home to the company, Land immediately began his research into the feasibility of a so-called instant photographic system. The concept of instant photography was not new at the time, with early attempts having been closer to portable darkrooms than truly instant machines. However, an instant film system had yet to be successfully created. Land and his engineers would devote themselves to this new project, which ran under the codename SX-70, a name that would later be brought back for another of Land's projects more than two decades later. 
Between 1943 and 1947, Land passionately worked at getting the process to work, with the first successful test image coming in March of 1944, only a few months after his daughter had asked her question. In the end, the process Land and his engineers came up with worked like this. A negative film section and a positive print section would be inserted into a specially designed camera, with the image being exposed on, onto the negative section. The film would then be pulled through a set of rollers, where not only the two components would be combined, but also where the most important part of the process started. A small packet of chemicals, known as the pod system, bursts as the film passed through the rollers, combining the two segments together and spreading a chemical reagent across the film. The user would then wait a set amount of time before peeling the print off of the negative layer. It was during this waiting period that the magic of Polaroid film was occurring. The negative, fully developed and covered in a chemical goo, saw the silver halide crystals that had been exposed by the camera turn dark. The crystals that had not been exposed were then chemically transferred from the negative, spreading across the positive portion and creating a copy of the negative, leaving the user with a complete positive print of their image. After years of hard work and experimentation, Land decided that the technology was finally ready for its first public debut. In a press conference held on February 21, 1947 in New York City, Land stood before a crowd of journalists as he prepared his demonstration. He sat down in front of a specially converted large format camera and proceeded to take a self-portrait of himself. After the image was taken, the combined negative and positive sections of the image were put through a motorized set of rollers, popping the chemical pods and spreading the reagent. After 50 seconds, Land carefully peeled the image apart and held in his hand a perfect portrait of himself. To put it bluntly, the crowd was in awe, as gasps echoed the room and Land's accomplishment became the center of articles from the New York Times to Time magazine. The test had gone perfectly and had showcased to the world the technological accomplishment Land and his engineers had created, but now they had to translate this accomplishment into a commercially viable product. Another year and a half of intense and challenging product development followed this first test as Polaroid figured out how to translate their creation to the consumer market. Finally, on November 26, 1948, the company was ready for another demonstration. They had already convinced the world instant photography was possible, and now they had to convince the world to invest into it. Their response was the company's first camera, known as the Model 95 Land Camera. A heavy, peculiar-looking beast, the 95 used a smaller variant of the film used by Land in his demonstration. Known as Type 40 Roll Film, the film resembled contemporary medium format film spools, with a positive and negative spool each being loaded and the user manually pulling the film through the camera to advance and process each picture. When the picture was fully developed, the user simply opened the back door of the camera and peeled, peeled off their finished print, of which eight sepia tone prints were able to be produced from one pack of Type 40 film. Despite a price of $89.95, almost $1,000 in today's money, by the end of the 95's production run in 1953, the camera had sold more than 900,000 units. With the introduction of Type 40 instant roll film, the minor Massachusetts company had revolutionized photography, and the company under Land's leadership continued to push for even more innovation. While Type 40 sepia film had brought the format to the public in 1948, a true black and white film would debut in 1951, known as Type 41. More black and white film stocks would continue to be developed and released throughout the 1950s, culminating in Type 47, which debuted in 1955. Type 47 had a film speed of 3000, an incredibly high ISO in an era where most film, even other Polaroid films, rarely went above 100. This revolutionary high-speed instant film allowed for photographing in situations that traditional still film formats simply couldn't match at the time, and was the only commercially available 3000 speed film for quite a few years. This film would eventually be used in Polaroid Swinger Camera, an ultra-low-cost plastic Polaroid aimed at young adults which debuted in 1965 and would become an incredible success for Polaroid, allowing more people to be able to utilize the format. All this technology was impressive at the time, however the film and their cameras had to also appeal to the wider public who would potentially be purchasing them. 
For Land, his method of marketing his invention lay in appealing to the fine arts community. The first major artist to utilize Polaroid was Ansel Adams, a landscape photographer who requested Land to produce a film that could be utilized in professional large format cameras. This would result in Type 55, a black and white film which Adams used to create some of his most famous works and what would later become the standard for testing exposure on large format cameras. Similarly, pop artist Andy Warhol was a dedicated Polaroid fanatic, utilizing Polaroid's Big Shot and later SX-70 cameras to create his celebrity portraits. In fact, the portraits taken using his Big Shot would serve as the basis for many of his silk screen works which today are instantly recognizable. This program of collaboration with artists and celebrities continued throughout Polaroid's history, continuing into the modern era, such as having James Garner and Mariette Hartley promote Polaroid cameras throughout the 70s and 80s, Outkast promoting the brand in the hook of their song Hey Ya, and Lady Gaga being labeled creative director of the brand in 2011. By the start of the 1960s, Polaroid's camera and film sales had grown into their own popular niche of the photographic world. However, one type of film had yet to be debuted by Polaroid, and that was color film, still a relatively new development to the world of consumer photography at the time. After painstaking research throughout the 1950s, Land unveiled Polacolor Instant Color Film in 1963, debuting as Type 48 color film for existing roll film cameras. The debut of Polacolor also marked the release of Polaroid's second and longest lasting format, Type 100 Pack Film. PacFilm utilized a cartridge that contained both the film negative and the positive print in a more compact package than roll film. When the image was taken, a small paper tab was pulled, and then a second larger tab was pulled to push the negative and positive sections together for a set of rollers and out of the camera. The chemical pods would burst, and after a few minutes the image could be peeled apart, revealing the finished print. Similar to roll film, PacFilm found immense success in the consumer market, being the main format of Polaroid between 1963 to 1972. But unlike roll film, pack film so soon found even more success among professionals. The high resolution prints it made, coupled with the ability to be load in loaded into specialized film backs for medium and large format professional cameras, saw pack film find its niche as a tool for business, professional, and industrial use. Photographers would use pack film to test their lighting before shooting their regular film, and the film found applications as the main way to create passport and ID photos for business uses and as a way to duplicate slides or documents. Unlike roll film, which met its demise in the 1970s, pack film remained in production until the end of Polaroid in 2008 and was made by Fujifilm until 2016. What neither of these formats did, however, was fully realized Land's dream of a small, easy-to-use camera that would produce a truly instant photo. Both pack and roll film required the user to manually pull the film through the camera and wait to let it develop before revealing the image, preventing the user from immediately having the print. Since inventing instant photography, Land wished to realize this desire, but it wasn't until 1965 that the first prototype, cobbled together from pack film parts, took an image. The main hurdle to overcome was creating a way for the image to be taken and then developed safely in the sun outside of the camera, resulting in the creation of an opacification layer that would cover the image before fading away when the image was ready. After successfully getting the opacifier to work, the camera and its film soon began to take shape, gradually inching closer to a market-ready product. The final culmination of nearly a decade of research was revealed by Land in April of 1972 at a shareholders meeting, where he unveiled the new flagship camera of the company, SX-70, the same designation Land had used when inventing instant film in the 1940s. A fully automatic folding SLR, the SX-70 offered a far more simplified method of instant photography, introducing the world to the integral Polaroid that has become recognizable today. As Land said, you, quote, press the button and have the picture. Starting out with the original SX-70 LAND camera, the line would eventually evolve into the more affordable Model 2 and Model 3, the improved Alpha 1, and the Sonar model, which utilized a sonar dish that sent out sound waves to focus, creating one of the earliest and most accurate autofocus systems ever implemented into a production camera. 
1976, Polaroid released the cheaper, non-folding Pronto line of plastic box cameras as a cheaper way to get into the SX-70 format. A simplified variant of the Pronto, known as the One Step in North America, eventually went on to explode in popularity, becoming the best-selling camera of the 1977 Christmas season and introducing many to the world of integral Polaroid film, along with becoming a cultural symbol of Polaroid even to this day. Polaroid up to this point had been in a unique position in the photographic world, as there were really no true competitors to their cameras, with any knockoffs utilizing the same film as their official counterparts. This period ended, however, in April 1976. Kodak, who had previously made some of the materials used by Polaroid in their pack and roll films, debuted their own instant integral film, known as PR-10 which borrowed heavily from Polaroid's technology, although Kodak argued that it was not infringing upon Polaroid as its film was exposed through the back of the image, not the front. Despite this attempt to protect themselves, Kodak soon faced a lawsuit from Polaroid, who claimed that Kodak was infringing upon their patents. The lawsuit lasted until 1986, when a judge ruled in Polaroid's favor and not only forced Kodak to pay royalties to Polaroid, but more importantly required that Kodak cease all production of new instant film and cameras immediately. Both companies had been producing cameras during this time, and the decision meant that millions of Kodak instant cameras were now rendered completely useless. By 1990, the final stage of the trial came to a close with Polaroid being paid $925 million, nearly $2 billion in today's money, by Kodak and preventing Kodak from entering the instant film market again. The nearly 14-year-long trial surprised the photographic world, as many had thought a relatively small company like Polaroid stood no chance in winning against a Goliath like Kodak, and strengthened Polaroid's place as the premier producer of instant film. Even with the incredible innovations that Land and his company had pioneered in instant still photography, Land still had his eyes set on the other major field in consumer photography at the time, movie film. Since 1961, Land had initiated research to begin engineering how to create a self-developing instant movie film format to compete with the ubiquitous 8mm and Super 8 movie cameras of the era, which had required users to mail their film away to be developed in a similar vein to standard photographic film. For Land and his engineers, their solution was to utilize a system known as additive color, a process that used overlapping red, green, and blue dyes to accurately render tones onto the film, albeit at the cost of a very dense and hard to project final image that required substantial external lighting to properly expose. The resulting instant movie system, now named Polavision, ended up consisting of specialized film cartridges containing both the film and development chemicals, which would be shot in the Polavision movie camera and then processed and viewed in the Polavision viewing unit. The system debuted in 1977, with Land giving an SX-70 style keynote address to Polaroid shareholders. This technological accomplishment, however, was overshadowed by what seemed like multiple glaring faults in the system itself, ranging from a lack of sound recording to an incredibly steep $675 for a basic setup, nearly $3,000 in today's money, with many of these faults being directly questioned at the original shareholders meeting. The most serious issue, however, was the then new market of home videotape, which Sony had introduced two years earlier with their Betamax format. Videotape could re record sound, store much more video, one to two hours compared to the three minutes of Polovision, and could be viewed on a standard color television set with a VCR. Despite attempts to promote the system using artists and celebrities like Andy Warhol and Danny Kaye, Polavision barely lasted until the summer of 1979 before being discontinued, with Polaroid forced to take a $68 million loss equivalent to $248 million today. Polavision had been Land's pet project, and his insistence to pursue the project even in the face of a lack of market sustainability meant that he was at the center of blame for the failure. By 1981, Land chose to give up not only his position in the company, but also his entire stake in the company, fully stepping down from any role or connection within the company. Stock prices for Polaroid tanked as both the company and the wider industry as a whole questioned if Polaroid could survive without its founder at the helm.
The catastrophic failure of Polavision left Polaroid at a low point the company had never faced at that point in its existence. The start of the 1980s saw the company not only in fi financial trouble, but without land at the helm, questions were raised by investors and market analysts over whether the company could survive into the 1980s. At this point, the company needed to find something that could help rebuild their finances, and a camera system that had debuted right before Land's departure would aid in this plan. Polaroid's SX-70 line of plastic cameras and film had become the flagship product of the company. However, the slow ISO 160 meant that the cameras would often struggle in indoor and low-light scenarios. To address this, Polaroid had developed a new higher ISO integral film based off of the SX-70 film with the creation of the 600 series. This new high-speed film, which was released alongside its own line of compatible cameras, soon became the focus of the company as it phased out its SX-70 consumer models in favor of the 600 line. Just like the plastic swinger and one-step cameras of the 60s and 70s, the 600 line appealed to the average consumer who wanted an affordable way to shoot Polaroid film. Two other notable instant film systems also emerged shortly after the 600 series, with both proving to be successful enough in their own respective niches. In an effort to reuse some of the technology and chemistry that had been created for Polavision, in 1983 a 35mm instant slide film was released. Known as Polychrome, the line was able to be used in any 35mm camera and could be processed using a special auto processor unit. Although a far more niche product than the 600 line, the Polychrome line found success as a quick and easy way for professionals to make copies of standard photographic slides. This was followed in 1986 by the Spectra line of wider aspect integral film, essentially a wide version of the 600 line that was aimed at a higher end market. Although it did achieve commercial success in the consumer market, it achieved far more success in more specialized roles and applications, with Spectra's becoming widespread in use with law enforcement and medical fields, along with filling the niche with professional photographers that had been left open with the discontinuation of the SX-70 line of cameras. To help secure their place in a changing photographic industry, Polaroid also explored expanding into other fields. Their efforts were aided by their dealings with Fujifilm of Japan. In the aftermath of the Kodak lawsuit, Fuji, who had been producing their own licensed version of Kodak's instant film in Japan, negotiated with Polaroid on the future of their instant film production. As part of the agreement, Fuji was allowed to continue the production of their own instant film, including both Kodak and Polaroid compatible formats, for the Japanese domestic market on the condition that they wouldn't sell these films outside of Japan, while Polaroid was able to gain access to both Fuji's instant film lines and, more importantly, Fuji's videotape technology. Polaroid used this agreement to begin production of its own line of videotapes, which helped to expand the company into the home video sector. Polaroid also released some of Fuji's instant film under their own brand name, albeit without as much success as they achieved with the videotape line. The success of the 1980s helped to bring Polaroid out of their first major brush with bankruptcy, growing the company to the largest point it would reach in its entire history. Fueled by the continued success of the 600 and Spectra lines and the growth of their videotape sales, Polaroid entered the 1990s worth $3 billion, nearly $6 billion in today's money, the most the company would ever be worth. However, that peak would soon be followed by the start of a gradual downward spiral that would begin to engulf the company in a way that even the Polavision debacle hadn't. Having found success with the introduction of the 600 and Spectra formats in the 1980s, Polaroid continued their development of new mass market instant formats. The first of what would amount to a trio of new formats debuted in 1993, known as the Captiva 95 after its accompanying camera system. Later renamed to the 500 series upon the introduction of the Joycam line of cameras, this format was smaller than the prior three integral formats, starting a trend of Polaroid attempting to create smaller, more pocketable instant formats. The 500 format was followed by the stamp-sized iZone pocket format in 1999, which was aimed at a younger audience and was the smallest film format Polaroid ever released. The last of these new formats came in 2001, when Polaroid, with the help of Fujifilm, released the Mio, a rebranded version of the Fuji Instax Mini line of cameras. Despite introducing these three new formats, none of them managed to achieve the same sustained success as 600, Spectra, or SX-70 film had. Although the 500 series saw some success with the Captiva and later Joycam line of cameras, 
the format began to lose momentum by the turn of the millennium. Similarly, the attempt to introduce Fuji's Instax line with the Mio failed to attract much support from the general public, despite Fuji's success with the line in its native Japan. The iZone did manage to achieve a noticeable boost in sales for Polaroid right after its introduction. However, the youth-oriented format turned out to be a fad as, it's, as it failed to sustain its success as its original user base grew up and left behind the format. Even with the minor early success of the 500 and iZone format, the introduction of newer formats had ended up hurting Polaroid's financial stability. This failure was echoed throughout the whole of the company as the 1990s progressed. The popularization of one-hour photo centers and the rise of early digital cameras throughout the 1990s began to chip away at the market Polaroid had once dominated. Although not oblivious to the rise of digital photography, having introduced the PDC-2000 in 1996, Polaroid did very little to adequately address the new wave, with their digital creations being too few and too low quality to achieve any noticeable success. Even their flagship 600 line began to suffer as the company focused on making gradually lower-end cameras like the 600 Express line in an effort to remain somewhat profitable, relying on short-term novelty cameras to try to regenerate interest in the brand. Much of this change in direction came from the management held that was going on within Polaroid at the time. 1995 had seen a new individual named president of the company, an outsider named Gary DiCamillo, DiCamillo had taken strategies he had used to help save other struggling companies and decided to implement them with Polaroid. DiCamillo's strategy called for short and fast product development, a practice that went against the slow but careful method Polaroid had been using. This meant that more products could be put on the market in the short term, all in an effort to recapture the dying consumer end of Polaroid's market. However, although this did create some successful products like the 1600, it failed to adequately address the needs of a consumer market that had begun to favor digital images over physical prints. Stock prices plummeted to single-digit amounts, and 2001 saw the company file for bankruptcy. The company was then purchased and restructured for the investment arm of Bank One, One Equity Partners, with the company again being sold in 2005 to the Petters Group Worldwide Company. This tumultuous series of buyouts saw executives like DiCamillo and the buyers of the company walk away with substantial payouts while nearly all the 6,000 pensioners who had worked for Polaroid lost their benefits and were left with very little. The writing had been on the wall since 2001, and by 2006, Polaroid ceased production on all new instant cameras with the last 1600 model rolling off the production line that year. In 2004, Polaroid quietly quietly stockpiled its remaining chemicals and materials and began to slowly close down its production facilities. By 2008, these supplies had finally run dry, and Polaroid announced that they would be no longer manufacturing instant film, releasing the last batch of film that year. The decision was met with disdain and horror from the photographic community, and as the company fell around them, multiple Polaroid executives were charged with fraud and manipulating the company assets for their own gain. After the 2008 bankruptcy, the Polaroid name and its likeness were sold off as its instant film production was completely ceased. What remained of the company gradually shifted from photographic tools to becoming a brand applied to no-name or rebranded electronics, with its only cameras being low-end digital cameras with zinc paper printers, ironically a technology Polaroid had developed at the turn of the millennium, but it had abandoned during bankruptcy. The Type 100 pack film side of the business was sold off to Fujifilm, who would use it for the production of their own pack film types, and the remaining supplies of 20 by 24 materials were purchased by John Reuter to be stored for future use. At the same time as the original company was being dissolved, a group of Polaroid enthusiasts over in Europe were working to try and attempt to produce brand new film for these now obsolete cameras. Led by three men, Florian Capps, Andre Bozman, and Marwan Saba, the group was able to purchase the last remaining Polaroid factory, which was located in Neshede, Netherlands, which included the equipment needed to produce a handful of the original formats, 600, SX-70, Spectra, and 8x10 integral films. Between 2008 and 2010, the company worked to recreate Polaroid's chemistry from scratch, as certain chemicals used in the original process were now illegal. 
With the first examples of new instant film entering the market in 2010 under the name The Impossible Project, the new film was unstable, more expensive, and only contained eight images per pack due to being larger than the earlier film. However, it was gradually tweaked and improved as the years continued. Eventually, Impossible was able to secure part of the rights to the Polaroid name, being renamed Polaroid Originals in 2017, and eventually purchased the full rights for the name in 2020, finally renaming itself to just Polaroid. Impossible was also able to release the first new Polaroid-type camera since the 1600, the Impossible i1, in 2013, along with a battery-less form of 600 film called iType. This was followed by the more successful and cheaper 1-step-2, 1-step-plus, and now models, which took design cues from the 1-step cameras of the 1970s. 2020 did, however, see the final demise of the Spectra line of film after repeated issues with the new film, the last packs being produced at the end of 2019. Another added effect of the demise of Polaroid in 2008 was that Fujifilm no longer had to restrict its instant camera lines to the Japanese domestic market, now being free to export them to the States. Fuji brought over its Instax line of consumer integral films along with its professional FP line of pack film, including licensing their Instax minifilm to Polaroid under the name Polaroid 300. Instax, specifically the mini line, soon skyrocketed in popularity in much the same way Polaroid had in the 1970s and 80s, with the Instax line now being the most profitable portion of Fujifilm's pho photography business. The Instax line remains immensely popular, with a mixture of analog and hybrid cameras and printers available. In 2016, Fuji debuted its Instax square format, which resembled the classic square frame of Polaroid integral film. Fuji's pack film line also found its niche among professional and industrial applications, with its FP100C color film being utilized in the passport industry until the switch to digital. In 2016, Fuji announced the complete discontinuation of FP100C, thereby ending Type 100 pack film production. In 2018, Florian Caps, one of the original founders of the Impossible Project, started the One Instant Project, which was an attempt to produce a new Type 100 pack film for vintage Polaroid and Fuji cameras. After a successful Kickstarter that raised over 200,000 euros, early production and development has begun on One Instant through Caps company SuperSense. The film utilizes preserved original Polaroid P7 color and 672 sepia chemicals saved through John Reuter's 20x24 studio to produce new sheets of Type 100 film. Attempts have also been made to recreate the Type 55 format for large format cameras for the company New 55. However, the New 55 company has struggled to achieve this goal, and although it has produced some new film, has undergone multiple restructurings and has an uncertain future, with the original attempt having failed in 2017. Currently, the company and its staff are producing film again, albeit in limited quantities with the help of SuperSense. In an age where digital cameras are in everyone's pocket, it seems almost comical that instant photography still exists in any form, let alone as a popular analog medium. Yet if you were to hand someone a Polaroid and ask them what it was, they would most likely have no trouble in telling you what it is. In a world of cheap digital cameras, instant film is still successful enough for it to support both Fujifilm's and the modern Polaroid company's business. In an age of connectivity through social media where thousands of photographs can be shared easily, someone's face will still light up when they are given an instant photograph. In 2021, seeing a teenager with a plastic Instax or Polaroid camera is no stranger than it would have been decades ago. Polaroid has become part of our cultural lexicon, even to those who aren't interested in photography. Edwin Land's style of interactive demonstration and showmanship directly inspired and influenced one of his disciples, Steve Jobs, who translated that same energy into what would become the world's most profitable technology company. One of the most popular social media sites of the modern era, Instagram, has a logo based on the famous one-step cameras Polaroid made during the 1970s. Musicians continue to include the imagery of Polaroid into their songs and music videos, while visual artists have long used Polaroid photography to experiment and push creative boundaries in their work. Even major entertainment companies like Disney have collaborated with Polaroid and Fuji to create unique tied-in instant film merchandise. When Land started Polaroid in the early 1930s, the Massachusetts-based company was simply a small engineering firm that blended in with its contemporaries, 
Yet over nearly a century of innovation, from success to failure to rebirth, Polaroid and the photographic inventions it pioneered have remained an ever-present piece of society, a position that it seems will continue to be maintained into the foreseeable future.